Welcome to Best Decision Ever, where we believe that life comes down to very few moments and decisions. So on this show, we highlight the very people that have had the courage to overcome fear and make the decision to start that company, begin writing that blog, or just stand up for what they believe in. And on this show, we know that success is only one part of the story. So we dive into the challenges that these people have had to endure in order to get to their current point of success so we can take their mindsets and routines and apply those to our own lives. For those of you who are new, my name's John and I'm your host. I think of myself as a performance enthusiast. I love staying down people who are at the top of their game and learning from them so I can take those lessons and apply it to my life. And today, we have a very special guest and a good friend of mine. He's been in startups since about the age of 19. He's worked for companies like Lumanu and Lone Snap. He then broke his way into the VC industry by getting a job at a early stage venture capital firm called True Ventures, where now he is in essence the in-house crypto expert, where he's helped his team to invest tens of millions of dollars into the crypto market, into companies like Biconomy and FutureSwap. Without further ado, John O'Connell. Awesome. Thank you, John, for having me. Of course. So again, John's a good friend of mine. I'm very grateful to have him on. I think one of the things that's most interesting about you is you have a really good ability to uh, follow your curiosity and just have an ability to make things happen. But let's talk first about how did you get into, like, what was the story of you getting into tech, specifically the VC industry, which is really hard to break into for anyone? Yeah. Um, so yeah, why don't you tell us more about that? Um, well, it might be helpful, I mean, just for the audience to give context in our relationship. Like, you and I have known each other for, what, almost seven years now? I'm thinking probably back to the beginning of our time in college, um, and we both grew up not too far away from each other either. But um, yeah, I mean, my journey into the startup world and into venture, I would say, is just like a series of following different curiosities, probably not as consciously in the beginning, but a lot more intentionally as you know, I've gotten older and older. But, uh, you know, starting really, I'd say back in senior year of high school, uh, just reading TechCrunch and, you know, being, uh, grew up in Chicago um, and just like trying to learn and absorb as much of like this ecosystem that we're both very... I'd say privilege and you know humbled to be a part now um but starting there and then you know as soon as getting to marquette and milwaukee as a freshman trying to dive in as head first as possible uh, i remember my first day on campus going to what was at the time the cooler center uh, at marquette but now called the 707 hub that you know a bunch of our friends really helped to put together um and like asking who i can meet in milwaukee of all places to try to break into the industry um, and uh, from there started at like this amazing skills accelerator, same place that I know you were a part of called the Commons, which yeah. was it's just a spectacular program. Yes, it was. Uh, yes, it my was. freshman year of college where for three months we were put onto different project teams. You'd either start an idea yourself or work with like one of the big companies in Milwaukee. Um, uh, we helped to start a, a company then uh, called Vozilla, which uh, I was basically a CRM for auto dealerships. That was a spectacular failure, but like was my first foray, I would say heads deep into really building software. Um, and you know, from there I was actually connected to the generator folks, which is another accelerator in uh, Milwaukee um, that uh, seed invests in companies there and uh, met the team at Lumanu, which you could think of as just like a marketplace for connecting influencers to big brands. and joined there, interned there shortly after they, um, after they went through Generators Accelerator program, worked there for about, uh, about a year, uh, just as they were getting off the ground, and then uh, was very fortunate to get into uh, the True Ventures Fellowship, the tech, tech fellowship, which uh, has given me a lot of things, but I would say, you know, really, uh, at the time, a platform to go and explore what is Silicon Valley, what is the technology industry, uh, but I think more importantly, just like an amazing group of friends that has stuck with me um, sort of ever since. But, um, but part of that fellowship worked at a startup called Loan Snap, which is a big mortgage lending business. I worked on the product team there, uh, started dabbling my toes in crypto, I'd say that, you know, summer of 2018, not head steep, but you know, enough to just like know that that was an interest. Um, and then was out of uh, school, was uh, was fortunate enough to get a job at True Ventures, which was Lone Snap's largest investor, and then helped put together the fellowship program that, um, that I was a part of that summer prior. And then since joining True, it's been about 
almost three years now. Um, I have uh, slowly over time, my entire focus has been on uh, investing in crypto companies and protocols um, and, you know, helping to build our presence in, in the market there and work with you know, some, some of the best entrepreneurs in the world. So um, that's high level, happy to dive into anything mm -hmm. more specifically, but um, that's sort of the evolution. Yeah, and I appreciate that. Um, and it sounds like you've, you've really dug in early into the tech scene and just you've always had a willingness to reach out and like really try to meet people, even as you said, in, in Milwaukee. Uh, and just like be a, a catalyst for your own growth and just connecting with people. How important is it to go and do that as anyone's trying to break into an industry that they want to, whether it's VC, the general tech industry, or, or, in, or entertainment, for example? How important is it for people just to dive in and really try to get connected? I, yeah, I mean, it's everything, 100%. I mean, it doesn't matter what industry that you're in. Um, I mean, you have to be putting yourself out there, whether that's making connections, reaching out to people, or producing content like you're doing right now, um, or writing software, like one of those things. But putting work out there or reaching out to people, I mean, it is the single-handed most important thing for anybody, anywhere, any industry, period. Yeah. Yeah. End point. End right? point. Yeah. yeah. You're always about, like, you're always about putting things out there and testing them and like, I, I, not, like thinking a little bit, but then actually just like putting something out there and seeing how it goes. Where did that philosophy develop? Did you get that from True? Is that something you just like learned through, um, you know, reading about other founders? Like how did that, how did that come to you? Yeah, I would say, I mean, it's something that I've, uh, that I've done sort of my whole life is, you know, trying new things and seeing what's fun and then going with it. But like, I would say really has been internalized and like put into practice during my time at True uh, the past three years. I mean, uh, there's a lot of things that we champion, I would say internally at, at the firm, but uh, the biggest one, you know, above all else, at least the one that I've taken, you know, is big part of my life is just thinking abundantly and um, uh, really asking the question if there's a challenge or an opportunity to you. It's like, you know, why can't I do this? And like, really, how can I do this instead of, you know, thinking of the reasons why it like why it wouldn't work mm -hmm. or anything beyond that. And um, yeah, it's been tremendously, I would say, uh, I mean, it's absolutely changed my life. But um, when you stop, when you, you know, when the mind starts thinking of like the possibilities and like can take that at least that first two or three steps to get there, that's where, you know, really where opportunity comes from instead of stopping yourself before you even get started, right? Yeah, exactly. And let's, let's double tap on that a little bit. Um, then we could talk about crypto a little bit later, but like you are, you talk to, and I see it cause you're, you're, you're a good friend of mine. You talk to tons of founders. We talk to founders across the board now, specifically in crypto, but like that abundance mindset seems to be a pretty common theme. Like what, what do you think keeps people from having that type of, well, first off again, just more, um, more succinctly, how would you define an abundance mindset in the way that we're talking about now? And then why do you think a lot of people like struggle to have that? Yeah, totally. Well, I mean, I think we grow up in environments, whether it's playing sports or in school, or even just with your friends that like are inherently competitive per se, right? Like yeah. you feel a desire to look or sound cooler than you know the next the person right next to you or to be the captain on your football team or you know what the uh, prom queen or king or whatever have it be and uh, or be at top of your class and graduate and get that big prestigious job or, or or do whatever x y and z but then i think when you get into like uh when you get out of that environment especially as like a young adult you quickly realize that uh or hopefully you quickly realize if you're in the right place that like to really reach the upper echelons of any society it's not a competition against like anybody other than yourself and like uh the more that you think about others and what that what they are doing like the less you can think about like the game you want to play and um how you can go and distinguish yourself within whatever your passion is so um you know abundant the uh, having an abundance mindset to me is like simply that it's you know not thinking of other people as competition but you know really as like people each on their own individual journey that you could work with together to build cool stuff and uh try things out and hopefully make a difference yeah and it sounds like for you that it's again much less about i versus them versus just like my game and how can we work together to create something whereas you know sports tells us or just general society in my words i'd say not yours 
would say, hey, you know, it's you versus them. It's, you know, who gets who has a better GPA, who has a better ACT score. It's very zero sum. Totally. Right. How is having an abundance mindset, and was we're talking about it, how has it helped you as an investor uh, to just to just like make things happen? Um, double down on it a little bit. What, what of course. Mean? So like, I think a lot of times when you and I um, think about challenges or problems, I even found myself doing it. I'll go, oh, like, yeah, that would be great if I could go do that, but like, I don't have this resource, or I don't have enough time, I don't have enough money, I don't have enough this, I don't have enough that, yeah. right? Like, and I know that at True, you guys talk a lot about making sure you have an abundance mindset. You know, how, how is having that specifically now for you as an investor, how has looking through that lens helped you to make better decisions or just to find more opportunities that maybe you wouldn't have otherwise had if yeah. you didn't have that mindset? Well, I think like the biggest thing is when you start thinking that way, like you can start asking questions. Like it's, yes. it's all the about questions the ego, get better. right? Yes. It's yes. like um, the, the reason, and I'm speaking for myself, you know, if you're thinking about trying to do better than your, you know, somebody you're competing with at a different firm, competing with at a different firm, or like, you know, if you're a startup entrepreneur and you're thinking about that other competitor and building the same product or services you are like, again, it's like, that's you not thinking about how to do whatever you do best. And, uh, and then, you know, you're asking questions on like how to do something better than someone else. And just like, instead of inherently asking, like, how can I be a better version of myself? Um, which uh, easier said than done, but uh, is at least in my mind, what's really opened up um, a bunch of a bunch of doors. Then like when it comes to like a specific uh, product idea, or if you want to make content or you want to go on a vacation, whatever that is, and you start thinking about like the resources needed to go in there, like whether it is time, money, um, or something else, like usually if you have, like if you have a good enough reason and you really have the internal willpower to go out and do that, it's really a matter of like who in your network can, you know, help you piece together whatever mm -hmm. you need to do or, um, uh, like, can you go and at least get step one or two, you know, of the way there, uh, or, or along a journey, um, uh, to where you could prove to somebody who has the resources that you have, you know, to help you get to that next level. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, hopefully that, yeah, maybe that, I'm being too theoretical. No, but, no, no. Uh, what, what, <laughs> the, what the, the key, the key point I wanted to, I wanted to make there was like your, and you had said earlier, having an abundance mindset and the reason why i've taken time to go to go down and do this is because like you're really good at it and you ask better questions you don't ask like oh like how do i like why can't i do this or you know like how is this not going to work or uh you know, like why do i not have enough resources it's much more of okay no no resource constraints let's just imagine for a second how can we make this work right and i'm not saying you ask yourself that specific yeah. question but it's that it's that type of approach um Changing subjects a little we bit. Just, well, I was going to say before you jump to the next thing, I think it is like so much about uh, you have to know what you want to do, though, right? Like, I mean, that's the caveat, okay. right? Like, you really have to like know what you want to do. If you're sort of exploring or you don't know that and like you're trying to do something that like isn't like of your nature or like isn't something that you actually want to do, but like it looks shiny, like you're grinding. Oh, this is a good point. This is a good um, point. Uh, you're grinding, a, you know, assistant to an assistant in the music industry or whatever, but it's like not what you're actually passionate about. Like you're not, it's like you're, you're not going to get past step one, two or three, either that or you're just going to live a miserable life. But um, you have <laughs> to know point. it. Like if you know what you want to do, like over a long enough period of time, then it like you're like the success is inevitable it's just like really the learning along the way that can to get to you to wherever you want to go but you have to know that first, okay which might be the harder part but, okay um, so then let's actually talk about that that's the so part. the next question would be john how do people how, how do people learn what they want to go do and like what was that process like for you yeah i mean um i mean there's a lot of different schools of thoughts like you don't know what you want until like you've experienced a taste of it right like you don't know you like a certain type of music unless you go to your like first festival or something, or um, you don't like you like a certain you, you don't know you like a certain food until you try it for the first yes. time. Um, uh, and like you know, one school of thought would be like early in your life or in your career, like try to put yourself in a place where you can taste as much of things as possible until you really figure out like what it is that you love to do. Which 
like easier said than done because that probably requires you switching a bunch of jobs or doing whatever which actually if i think about people at the top of even the industry i'm in there's a lot of that early in their lives and careers of tasting and trying figuring things out and eventually figuring out you know getting on the path that they happen to be on today um but uh or the other one you know for me is like even when i think about uh investing or working with founders like i could tie back uh and this might sound cliche, but like tie back to me in elementary school reading about just like stocks on the playground mm-hmm. and like uh, talking to my friends about them or like why I think X, Y, or Z you go up or down, which is very different than venture what I'm doing now, but like the investing mindset and then like entrepreneurially, you know, running like small businesses around town. Me and my best friend uh, had a, a moving business when we grew up in high school and early college that was like so much fun. Uh, and like when you get that taste of like autonomy and freedom and like could you know pay even just like little bills of going out to dinner with your friends like you know then when you get when you get those feelings you combine those ingredients then you can you know that's at least what painted the picture um of directionally what i wanted to do later in life i'd say so Mm -hmm. and like how can people determine what their we're getting, we're getting a little nitty gritty, but how can people determine like what they're naturally good at? A lot, I, I think a lot of people struggle with not only one, just like getting over the hump of, okay, I'm gonna go try, I'm gonna change my job to go try a different industry, or I'm gonna go start this company, or, or but like how can people just even taking a step back, get a better feel for like what they're good at and what they're naturally inclined towards? As you mentioned earlier, you wanna find something you're naturally inclined towards, um, and it's something that just kind of comes a little bit more easily. Even like uh, Naval talks about this, right? So yeah, you might dive in a little bit more in, into that. So into finding your strengths. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it comes with self-awareness over time, which like um, you both get from like doing a quality piece of work, maybe putting something on the market and then mm-hmm. like having the market tell you whether or not like you were good at it. And, you know, for investing, maybe that's you invest in a bunch of companies and some of them start to perform well maybe if it's you write music you have one or two songs that you know make a that that, you know one that sort of have a hit or a small you know blip or whatever um and like that's one way but like i would just fall back to is like what are you having like what's the most fun for you yeah yeah, yeah. you know and like if you're having fun doing what you're doing like it won't feel like work and like you're going to do it so off so much and so often that you'll end up being very good at it right if it's actually fun for you and like, not to say you, you have still have to do the nitty gritty, whatever bullshit work that like is not fun to be able to do the fun work. But um, if you know what is fun, like follow that and try to do that as much as possible. You become good at it. Yeah, and I, that's something you're really good at. Is is you always use the phrase like following your curiosity. You're very good at following what's fun, and then when you when, when you when you find like your thing, you you can dive into it and just kind of make. Um, make something out of it. Yeah. With that in mind, do you mind talking about your transition? As I understand it, and maybe you can shed light on this, like when you first were at True, you were, I believe, investing or looking at like software and crypto, and you transitioned to full time into crypto. Like, do you mind telling us a little bit more about how you followed your curiosity into crypto and just what yeah. that's what that's been like? Yeah. So, I, as I mentioned earlier, I've been at True now for. Uh, almost three years and like structurally the firm is built in a way where all of the people on the investment team whether you're a partner or whether you're a person younger in your career you have basically complete autonomy to like spend time like doing what is interesting to you uh, or like what's fun to you um, and like uh, no real questions about it and like with a structure time wise where like you have enough time to be able to like go and like find what you're passionate about or curious about um, without like the pressure of having to deliver quote unquote results today because like the game or you know the business that we're in is one where you know the outcomes of companies we invest in play out over a five to ten to in some cases 16 plus year time horizon you know whereas like common performance going back to like the beginning you know what we're talking about at the beginning if you're playing a sports game you can get the uh, your inputs might be in a 60 minute, you know, game on a field, but then your output is immediately after you get that immediate feedback loop. Whereas we're in a game where, uh, or a business, I should say a business that just like takes such a different time horizon than like what we're, um, accustomed to learning or, and to, or like what we've been cultured into thinking that it just takes a long time. But, um, I guess to directly, answer your question so uh, i would say the first year was um 
feeling things out. So spending time with a bunch of different people on our mm-hmm. team, uh, like different uh, different partners at our at our firm are, I'd say, more or less focused on different things. We can invest or um, spend time with any entrepreneur in the firm. Um, zero attribution, meaning if uh, I have an, exci- an ex- investment I'm excited about or if someone else has an investment they're excited about, like um, we work together as a team to help each one of our companies to succeed. Um, so for the first year, I was really just exploring, figuring out what it was. And then, you know, I'd say it's going into summer of 2020 or yeah, summer of 2020. Um, my, uh, one of my colleagues, Adam Dongeli and I, um, started doing research into, uh, D5 stands for decentralized finance, uh, which we look back at history now, people call it summer 2020 D5 summer, but a few of like the very early protocols or companies started getting like uh, tremendous traction very quickly. And um, me and Adam put together like this research report that ended up um, a few months later manifesting into like two or three early investments. Um, uh, the firm in the past like has made a, a couple investments at True before that point, um, uh, back in call it 2017 through 2020, we made a few investments in crypto. But after that summer and after those first few investments, after this research project Adam and I did, Uh, like we sort of just went heads on and, um, you know, team, you know, I'd say, and like the team has been fully supportive and we have, you know, a huge group of people now going after the category, you know, for context, like in our sixth fund, which we raised in 20, um, 2018, you know, perhaps a 1% of every new investment we had was in crypto. Um, but then in. Uh, the seventh fund that we're, we're investing out of right now, it'll probably be close to 20% of the fund. So, I mean, like wow. a dramatic shift. That is shift. a big shift. It's a dramatic shift. And, you know, now we have probably, I would say, six or seven people internally who are more or less focused on the category full time. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we have a community now of about uh, 45 companies in building crypto across uh, DeFi, NFTs, um, supporting software, and every you know everything sort of in between. Um, uh, over 100 founders, very all over the globe. But it's became a very very big part of our mm-hmm. business, and I would say since 2020 onwards, after that summer onwards, and you know gearing up as we think about um, gearing up to become a bigger part of our business going forward into the future. So, um, but and, you know and that was a process where like that research project in the 2020. Um, totally optional. Did not have to go and do that. Like, um, like that was just you know Adam reaching out to me and saying, "Hey, it's somebody you want to spend time on?" And I was like, "Sure." So me and him went deep, um, and like I fucking loved it. And uh, uh, it shows. Uh, yeah, and, <laughs> it shows. Uh, you, you are you are deep, my friend. And uh, it's basically since then. I mean, it's my entire life now. Yeah. So it's um, uh, yeah, it's just been my entire life. Um, and giving me a real purpose. So it's, it's fun. It's good yeah. stuff. Let's, um, if we can, let's dive into that. And I know you can talk the nitty gritty all day. Let's keep this more high level and then go deep if we need to. But I'd love to just better get a sense of like, if, 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 if you were have if you had to, and this is for, for people watching, like if you had someone ask you, Hey, like John, what is like, what is crypto? Why does it matter? How would you just begin explaining that in like an elementary way? For people who just eat, watching either have heard of it but don't really know about it, like, or just are just curious. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot that goes into it because like the industry today is so much more expansive than what it was even just a few years ago. But like in the simplest form, like all a blockchain is, or people talk about a blockchain, it's just a database. Like that's literally all that's it is. It's not similar, yeah. or it's like the same exact like structure as like an Amazon Web Services thing where you'd build a Facebook or Instagram or a social app or enterprise software app, you know, in the past, but with like the key caveat of it being that it's decentralized. So like, instead of like one server being in like a company's headquarters or at like uh, AWS that you're referencing, like uh, there are thousands or in some cases, tens of thousands of these servers or computers running all over the world simultaneously, meaning that if you build an application on it and, um, and somebody uh, uh, or somebody were to want to shut it down, you can't because uh, uh, all of these servers are running simultaneously the same t- the same lines of code at the same time all over the world at the same time. Um, uh, so it's global. It's global. Uh, it's 
decentralized and you know it's censorship resistance. Uh, so you can build some really, I would say, provocative and disruptive technologies on here um, that you otherwise wouldn't uh, wouldn't be able to build on centralized infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And then the entire industry is built off the top of that. So I mean, that's just like the base layer okay. infrastructure, and then you know you could go into any of the categories on top of that as well. Okay. Okay. So like that's that that was that's a really good description of just like what blockchain I got that that kind of that, that click for me and I, I feel like people watching could definitely understand just again generally like what blockchain is. What now are the different applications? Like when people say crypto, like what are a couple of the applications that people uh, should be aware of when thinking about crypto? Because it's not just like, oh I can like buy things per se. Yeah. There's other applications. Um, what are those? Yeah, I mean there's so many. Um, you know, I'm thinking just a few examples in our portfolio. One would be uh, like and art blocks, which you could think of as it's an NFT platform. Mm -hmm. So, but for generative art, so for uh, not you know, it's been this uh, generative art is, as a technology has existed for decades. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, something the, the earliest days of people writing software on computers. But uh, basically, all how it works is there's a software engineer. You could write a short algorithm for one of n uh, iterations of a specific type of artwork that mm -hmm. you know they may want to put out there. And um, artwork and the uh, artist can go to Artblocks, take their code, uh, uh, have it uh, live on, uh, like upload it to Artblocks smart contracts, and then as a user goes in and um, wants to purchase a piece of artwork from this artist, they go and connect to their Ethereum wallet, pay whatever the price is, and then get one of you know whatever random iteration of that artist's work is as they actually mint the piece. So I mean that's a very particular domain. We're talking like a type of artwork mm -hmm. relative to a urine finance, which uh, is a is a uh, company or I should say a protocol that I'm super, you know, that I'm super, super, it's probably my favorite protocol in the industry, but, um, but um, they basically function as a decentralized hedge fund where, you know, you could take whatever crypto you have, maybe it's ETH, maybe it's USDC, which is basically US dollar coin, or maybe it's something else and you can deposit it into urine and they have this group of strategists think of as like a portfolio manager or a, a quant at a hedge fund who are writing strategies that basically oh. optimize where your crypto is invested and earning interest at any given time. Okay. Um, and like it's totally flipping the idea of how an investment fund should be structured on its head whereas instead of you working like siloed within a singular fund or vehicle, uh, like with your team internally there, and like you manage a private pool of capital, these group of uh, strategy writers who work for Yearn, and when I say work for a year, they're not employees, like they're completely, you know, uh, some, uh, many of them are anonymous who are writing these, these uh, algorithms. They are incentivized to like write the best code possible, or the best uh, algorithm possible, because they earn a, percentage share of any of the interest that's generated for the oh, users that do it. Okay. And anybody can go and submit strategies. Like they have a whole academy system that could train up new strategists. Like, um, and uh, it's this really crazy way of building a firm or a practice from the ground up to help people earn money. But take a step back again, like you think of the industry, I mean, those are two very specific types of examples. There's thousands of others. I mean, when we think of techno the technology world today, like you know, the, the blockchain or crypto, whatever, it's not gonna, you know, it'll, I think in 10 or 20 years from now, it's just gonna be, you know, a way that people capitalize or structure businesses in any vertical in the tech industry today. Um, but a few early examples there. Okay, and like, yeah. I would say within, within, within SaaS, you have like health tech, you have ed tech, you have um, integration platforms, right? Could you potentially put just for folks at home, like some of these things within different buckets so they can conceptually understand it? Yeah. Um, so like, I mean, the easy answer to that would be like the NFT industry is this massive juggernaut that's really came off of the ground over the past year. OpenSea, whatever, uh, is the biggest marketplace valued at I think, over $13 billion today. Um, and like, that's one category, decentralized finance, which Yearn is part of that category is another. Uh, and there are a bunch of other different categories, but like the big meta thing is like any of those two categories or companies built in there, like that's not what's important. What's important is like the way that the companies are built and like structured with tokens that are given out to users of the mm -hmm. platform, which represent more or less ownership of the protocols. Like you're, you know, there is a, a future that isn't, uh, you know, too far away where 
you know, maybe if you walk into a Starbucks and buy a cup of coffee or into your local coffee shop that you earn a few tokens just for going there and participating and um, that represent ownership over that, that coffee shop. And then, when, you know, if you're a frequent customer, you own more than somebody who has only been there once or twice, and then you have, have an incentive to help that coffee shop to succeed, right? Because you own oh, a little tiny part of it. So okay. it'll, it'll be embedded into, you know, the way that we just live our lives with everything. But it's okay. going to take a long time to get okay. there. Okay. That was helpful, though, that you could abstract that and kind of put it in buckets because I think it's just a helpful, it's a helpful metaphor yeah, to go totally. do that. Thank you for that. So thinking in line with crypto and you and I were talking about this even on the way here let's say uh, I've just heard about crypto I want to learn more about it I don't have that much liquid cash right but like how do I go about learning about yeah what's the best way to go about learning about this stuff yeah I mean um, and I think the same goes with really any industry is you really just have to I would say find a way to peak your curiosity and then like go and just meet as many people as humanly possible so like uh, I mean, the easiest way <laughs> to like peak, that. <laughs> the easiest way to peak your curiosity is to just invest a small amount and like nothing that's going to change your life or put you in a tough financial circumstance, but just something where like you have skin in the game that gives you an incentive to go and learn, Hey, what did I just invest in? And like, what does that really mean? Uh, and then like the rest of the money or whatever, if you're not, if it's a small amount of money, like that's just, you know be spent if or depending on I should it depends on what your goal is if your goal is to break into the industry or to like you know try to find the next frontier of technology then you know the rest of that money should be going towards like if it's coming to New York City or the Bay Area or wherever and trying to just meet as many people as humanly possible and build relationships and you know make that break for you to get in um, which is only going to come in via relationships but you know that day that could just be on Twitter and DMing people or you know, replying to whatever, you know, replying to tweet threads or saying, you know, posting articles or, or whatnot. But like the money isn't as important as like the activity and the money is a tool to help you do the activity. Then, you know, that's, that's what it can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it sounds like establishing the network, which is, which is true. And it's, it's, it's something that you do really well and then just diving in and, um, and depending on what your goal is, but if you just want to learn, put, you know, a non, um, you know, non, important amount in, in and just kind of see what, what 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 happens with that so that you can learn and just see how the how, how crypto works yeah well i mean like i'll flip it back to you i mean the same principles if like you're starting a podcast right like are you going to be more invested if you spend a few hundred bucks buying podcast equipment and like having very it good in your point. room yeah or like not <laughs> yeah very good point very good point right. just like just so. just just diving in uh i really appreciate that and that's that's a good way for people to dive in, learn. It's just a good philosophy of learning too. It's just taking the time, getting a little bit invested and allowing yourself to learn and to grow from there. Totally. Um, that said, let's talk a little bit about just attitude, mindset, when you're looking at crypto and looking at you know, things to invest in in general, and this might be getting a little bit nitty gritty, but how do you determine like what's worth putting money into and what's not? Is this kind of the same thing as like, stocks and bonds or is it a little bit different like how do you can you just like at a general level just um, share some of the questions you ask yourself to yeah i mean it just depends on what your strategy is mm -hmm. so like um i'm an early stage technology venture capitalist and like you know, so when i'm investing um uh or w when we're investing our limited partners capital you know our goal is to maximize risk at the early stage as much mm -hmm. as possible and maximizing risk in the sense of like having as much upside as humanly possible, um, you know, while having like a limited amount of downside on any individual investment. But like that investment or that strategy is much different than if you're at home um, and are using a Coinbase account or whatever else and um, uh, are just trying to make, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, or X percent per year on your on your money. So it really depends on your strategy. I focus on the early stage stuff and like that's what gets me excited, excited. But investing as a discipline is like so dependent on the strategy and it's so different depending on like if you're working at, if you're investing your own money or if you're uh, focused on growth stage investments or uh, liquid investments mm -hmm. or things that are trading versus early stage. So fall back on that. Okay, okay. So yeah, it, it's, it, it sounds like, really know your strategy and just know 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 what you're what you're after first and then you can you, you can kind of go from there yeah well and i mean also like the the meta comments of this is like you should be investing your money in crypto 
And like, you know, maybe if on a personal level, like if you have somebody managing managing it for you, you should have some exposure. But like, uh, depending on how much money or wealth that you have early in your career, really every dollar should just be going back into like helping you find and then double down on your curiosity yeah. as much as possible, whatever yeah. that is. Yeah, which you know, like yeah, like you're 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 gonna have much higher leverage on investing money into your podcast than you would be in trying to find the next crypto token, right? I think at least tell me maybe maybe you you became passionate. This is this is actually this actually a really good point you make, which now we're going to use to transition is taking the time to understand that you're really good at going okay, like what do I need to be focused on? What do I need to be working on? Whereas personally, I found I'm really good at like how. If you say hey, like we need to like you know go accomplish X Y Z, I'm like great, I can I can I can go and do. But like you have a really good game at being able to determine, well, first, like, what is it that we need to be doing? And then we can focus on how, uh, how what, wh- like, how would you go about helping people to determine like what they should be focusing on? Cause I think a lot of people think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to go focus on, even said at the, at the, at the top, the, at the top of the interview, oh, I, I, I want to go hustle being an, an investment banker and they haven't really thought twice about it. Or, oh, I want to go and put my effort into this. Cause it's, 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 it's shiny. Uh, how do you help people or how would you advise people to uh, just think a little more thoroughly about what they're putting their time into before they just focus on how? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to the beginning of the conversation, and it's like having, um, it's like what gives you fun and enjoyment, right? And like, if you know what gives you fun and enjoyment, and it's something that you can build a business around, and in most cases you can, you know, like you you can figure out a way of building a business mm-hmm. around what you have fun, fun and enjoyment enjoyment with. Then at that point, you know, every resource, whether it's time, money, etc., should be going doubling down on that in the early days, if you're old and like this co- content or, you know, this podcast isn't for people who are old and rich. No, right? no, this is not, this is you not know, for that. If, yeah. if that's the case, then maybe, you know, you go and find your money manager or, you know, find a, you could have a percent whatever in uh, crypto or whatever, but like, that's not what this is for. This is, no, this is not trying to figure it out and don't try to play a game. Yeah. I, I would be remiss to say that people should try to play a game if it's not what gives them passion. If they're trying to make a quick buck, then like, you're you're fucked. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I like that. Okay. Uh, like it's like it's just not gonna work. Okay. So. I I I like and that. Then, like that it is ingrained in just like how you carry your life every day. Is you're probably trying to optimize things that you shouldn't be optimizing for. So. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's that's a good point. Like, just don't 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 optimize for bullshit, right? <laughs> just find what you're passionate about. And, yeah. Yeah, I, I I very much appreciate that. So looking back on all that, then what would you say in just like your career? what would you say has been your best decision thus far in your venture capital career or just in your, just exploring the passion of, of technology if you want to even keep it that that broad yeah i mean um the best single well best single decision like it's given me a lot of purpose obviously i'd say just like choosing to say no to anything other than crypto okay <laughs> obviously okay the best decision there uh but uh, more so, like more theoretically, it, it's like uh, really like making the conscious choice of putting the ego aside and just like like asking questions to people okay. who have been there and done that in your industry and like knowing that they know way more than you do and just being patient. Okay, like, let's talk about patience too. You and I, you and I talk about patience and just being curious yeah. and just having like a learner's attitude. How did you develop that? Like, was there a moment where you were where you um, like got over your skis and were like, oh, I made a mistake and now I'm going to have a winner's attitude or did you always have that? Like, how did you develop that philosophy? Um, no, I mean, uh, I would say uh, a tool that's been very helpful for me has been working with the Enneagram, mm-hmm. I would say. It's, yeah, uh, it's great book, by the way. Great. Yeah, that, well, it's a book. It's but a book, I mean, it's but more, it's a whole more, more a, thing than a book. It's a field of study, yeah, a, yeah, which yes, is all yes. about, uh, like, uh, there are nine core uh, there are nine core personality types. Mm-hmm. Usually some person, everybody has one main type and then two or three like side types per se. Um, and then uh, you can know what yours is and they have different, as a strengths and weaknesses assigned with a type uh, or biases as well. Um, and then if you know that, you can you know, you probably know how you're interacting with the world on any given day. And then you can also figure out like who you're communicating to, what type they are and like know how to best communicate and have the best conversation with them. Yes. So that's been an incredible tool. And like through that tool, you could start like really training yourself to feel like the, 
physical manifestation of your ego. And this might sound <laughs> yes, a little no, this is awesome. Lala, but go it's into this. Go into this. Your neck getting a little more tense tight. Yep. And, yep. Um, you're getting just like a little more angry and. Um, Maybe it's a little pressure in the back of your head. And when you feel that coming, you know, then it's usually a time to just take a breath and step back and, you know, realize that you're probably not as special as you think you are. <laughs> so <laughs> awesome. Thank you. We should put this at like the front of the interview. You're not so, as special as you think you are. Uh, how has... Let's not do that. <laughs> let's not do that. You are as special as what you think you are. Oh, Pursue your dreams. Oh, you, God. Should, you, actually, you should pursue it. But I agree I with think, that. But in order to get to the place where you're really special... Um, you have to like realize you're not special. You can't yeah. think you are in the beginning. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and you actually never are. The, like you never are. It's, yeah. you're, it's always the next thing, right? That you're yeah. not an expert in. So, how, how has that decision to dive into the Enneagram changed you as a person? Yeah, it just made me a lot more patient. It's really made like the relationships close to me a lot, um, a lot more meaningful. And, um, uh, and, you know, you just kind of realize what your strengths and what your weaknesses are. Like, um, I'm very good at what you're mentioning earlier is the high level, um, uh, like high level, like being excited, being super optimistic yes. about things and like directionally, like the way to go on a particular decision or opportunity. But like the nitty gritty work is something like the details is something I have to be very purposeful about. It's not something that comes, comes easy to me, but, um, uh, yeah, I mean, that was something that uh, I would say it's a huge advantage for us at True is we all, uh, back well, very shortly after I got started, we all took the test together, so we all know each other's types. So then mm -hmm. if we get on to a project together or we're working on a new investment, um, you know, maybe I'm a seven, so I know I'm hyper-optimistic. I think the big picture, and you, you know, maybe pair me with somebody who's uh, a type three that's, you know, much more detail-oriented, much more achievement-oriented, or maybe a type five that's very investigative and wants to like just know the things that you don't know right and if you could form a team of two or three people of different types then um you could probably get to a better decision than you would if it's just yourself or just three people of the same types so yeah um but that's been something i truly has done and uh it's really a big part of our language of how we talk to each other and um of how we look at opportunity that's been a game changer so yeah, it, it it sounds like it's just a very thorough way to go about. It gives it in essence it gives people a lot of self awareness. Of yeah, what am I good at? What am I maybe not so good at? Or naturally inclined totally. to? Like, what do I need to watch out for? Yeah. Um, and I've I've, de I've definitely seen that in you too. Just an awareness of yeah, like you just not like not getting worked up and stuff. You know, it's just very just like even and just being being uh, being aware of things. Check so yourself. as we exactly check, yeah, uh, as we wrap up, before we ask the final question, where can people find you? Uh, at JPO GMI okay. on Twitter or okay. uh, the future of friends F R E N S podcast on uh, anywhere you listen to a podcast. The future so. of friends. Yeah, but you just go to my Twitter and you can find okay. it. So, yeah, okay. Okay. Cool. Wonderful. And what is this for the viewers? What are what is this podcast on? Uh, it's just very deep crypto conversations. Just like okay. what's happening in the industry. Like what are the stories or companies or people to keep an eye on? Uh, and it's something I just do because it's fun. Uh, okay. It's just, it's a hobby, but, okay. uh, but, uh, Twitter's the best place to find me. Okay. God knowing you, it'll probably turn into something very worthwhile and Hopefully. big. Uh, yeah. with that said, what advice would you give to someone? The final question, as I always ask to our guests, what advice would you give to someone that is on the other side of a big decision? Maybe they want to move across the country to start a new job. Maybe they want to start a company. Maybe they just want to begin writing a blog or starting a podcast, right? What advice would you, would you, would you give them if they're debating doing that? Um, slow down. You probably don't have to make the decision as quickly as you have to do. If it's that big of a decision, slow down, take a breath. Uh, and if you're, you know, follow your gut. And if it's something that you think you should do, like, do it, try it out. And if it's amazing, you'll keep doing it. And if you don't like it, there's no pressure to, to, to keep going that way. But if you have the... If you have a big decision and you are thinking of it as a big decision, it's probably something you have to do, right? If it's on your mind that much, it's probably something that's worthwhile for you. I love that. Yeah. So. Yeah. If it's, if it's repeatedly on, on your mind, it's probably something you need to decide on. And when, if you need to decide on it, slow down, take, take deep breath and then follow your gut. Totally. I love it. Well, yeah. you guys heard it. Thank you guys so much for watching. Slow down, take a deep breath, <laughs> trust your gut, then decide and follow your curiosity. Thank you so much for watching. I'll talk to you soon.